Hello. Brassic Gamer here, <clears throat> as ever. Uh, my latest acquisition comes as a result of some extreme good fortune or good luck. And I was speaking to a random guy who said that he saw a really old computer in a local laptop store on display. It was about 30 years old and it was getting a lot of attention, but they didn't know what to do with it. <clears throat> so I went in there today and I said, hey, I collect and restore old computers. Do you have anything like that lying around? Um, and they said, ah, well, most of the stuff we get that old, it's, uh, you know, really broken and we, we trash it or we, we skip it. And I'm thinking, what? You what? Because I can guarantee that most of that stuff is like salvageable, just they don't have the time to deal with it. <clears throat> so they pull this thing out. <laughs> and I couldn't quite believe it. I mean, yes, that is the bag. That is the bag. And there it is. An Epson PC AX3S portable. Now, there is little or no information on this computer online. What there is appears to be Italian. Um, look at the size of that power brick. That's bonkers. Um, now, there are a few question marks over this because <clears throat> purely looking at the model number, I would have guessed that it was a 386 system. Um, it doesn't plug into the mains, straight into the mains, so it must have a battery that can power it, because proper luggables, you just plugged them into the mains and um, took them wherever you needed to and then plugged them, yeah, just plugged them in wherever you go. But uh, for this to be, see, like the compact portable or the IBM portable, they were luggables, so... You know, briefcase style or suitcase style, you just plug them into the mains and off you go. It's like a more compact desktop version. Now, there is a, a desktop version of this computer. This is basically the laptop version or portable version. You, can, you could put this on your lap, but you're better off putting it on the table, to be honest. Um, it's an intriguing piece of kit. The hinge is gone on the right-hand side, as is often the case on machines of this age because the plastic does get quite brittle. It's um, it's a black and white screen from what I could tell so far because I managed to boot it into DOS. Um, but on closer inspection, because the guy in the shop was like, oh, I think it's probably an 80286 or an 8088. And I said, I reckon it's a 286 if anything, but look at that. VGA means that this is a 386. That's all you need to know, really. It is, there's no expansion on this thing. You've got VGA, parallel, serial, PS2 for a mouse, I guess, a proprietary expansion port, which would be for a modem, I guess. That's the um, AC adapter on off switch power saving mode what voltage does this thing run on and it's in amazing condition look at the color of that no yellowing whatsoever apart from the hinge it's in tip top nick so 4.4 amps 15 volts and it's very much a proprietary connector so without this you really wouldn't have much of a chance of getting this thing working. Now I can't find any information on it online at all, um, particularly the model, because you can download the reference discs from the um, Italian Epson FTP, but um, it says it doesn't recognize this machine or it won't run on this machine, so that's a bit of a bummer. So the next thing we do is we can take it apart and uh, just have a look inside and see if there's any clues to another name this computer might have. The model number doesn't turn anything up. E0650U. So you've got screw, 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 three screws on the back. And on the underside, 
we've got one screw there, one screw there. There is a depression in the middle of this sticker, but don't be fooled. Uh, you don't need to break that open in order to remove it, but you do need to pop open the customary carry handle and remove these five screws, otherwise you will end up snapping the chassis on the other side. Look at that big Epson logo on the bottom. This thing is really in mint condition. Okay, so. As is often the case with these machines, you just lift off the top. And there's a nice tidy little connector there for the display because often with these uh, with machines of this age you could have a color screen or a black and white screen or a grayscale screen and uh, I'm not sure which one this is whether it's black and white or grayscale but given it's a VGA system I would think it would be a bit of a waste to have black and white but stranger things have happened 486 laptops released by Toshiba in the early 90s were black and white so, that's an Intel chip, but it's a chipset chip, keyboard controller probably. So I'm going to take out the keyboard, I'm going to take out the power supply, and here we have the battery pack. Now there's probably, I don't know, I don't think that's the RTC battery, because it's too big for that, that probably holds a charge. Probably, I imagine it's a backup battery. So... You can't run the laptop on those batteries. You might be able to, but I don't know, haven't read, so can't say that you can. Um, often these kind of laptops, the more luggable ones, had a, a backup battery so that if you powered off, you could put it into kind of a standby mode so that next time you plugged it into a power socket, it would um, take you back to where you were. Now look at the size of this thing compared to the Toshiba T1000. There's only two years between these laptops. 1989-1987 and uh, the difference is quite quite tangible. I mean the weight alone is ridiculous but this one does have a number pad which is quite handy um, and obviously it has a three and a half inch hard drive um, and yeah one floppy disk that's all that's the only access you have to uh, storage media at all so let's uh, carry on stripping this down and see if we can find out more about the nature of this system it was incredibly easy uh, literally two screws that one and that one and it lifts off and this entire unit is one piece and you just have the, uh, the ribbon cable there which goes into this slot. Now this is a very interesting layout because this is the most modular laptop I think I've seen from this era. Obviously you've got something like a RAM Expansion here, proprietary of course. Um, or maybe this is for RAM because that doesn't interface with anything on this part. So I'm guessing these, these are the RAM chips. That would make sense. Um, that's gonna be the BIOS I expect. Um, and it is an Intel, can we get in on that and read it? No, we can't, I'm going to have to tell you. I can barely read it myself. 386SX16. So it's a late era 386, well, mid era, should we say, because the SX obviously came out after the DX. Um, the quad package had lower power consumption, so made it more suitable for laptops. The crystal... There tells us that it's a 16 megahertz system because that's half of 32. We have a gap for a CoPro there. And then you've got the Epson chipset. These are probably going to be um, 
gate arrays to integrate the various functions of the computer. So this board is completely removable Sparrow board. Mmm, that's interesting. That may help us identify this system better. Obviously, this board completely comes off and you can replace it with a different board with different RAM, different, well, the bus is interchangeable anyway, and a different CPU speed, depending on the specs you choose to have for the system. So I'm just looking. I mean, there is not a speck of dust on this thing. Apparently, a guy bought it into the shop. This is a place that sells like, iPads and, you know, iMacs and stuff. This guy brings in this laptop and he says, I've had this for about 20 years since I left my job. It's been under the stairs and my wife has finally had enough. And she said, it's me or the laptop. And I just could not bring myself to throw it away. So can you do something with it? So bless him. They put it on display for a week for a bit of publicity and then didn't know what else to do with it. So lucky I came in when I did. Hmm. Okay, let's continue stripping down. Okay, so that's the CPU board removed. <clears throat> Um, OKI RAM and this system has 2 meg of RAM and that is 256k for each chip looks like it's 10 is that milliseconds 10 milliseconds speed and <laughs> here's the battery which amazingly doesn't appear to have leaked normally you would see some corrosion some you know telltale green gunk around the end of the power connector but not in this case so this is quite a simple shrink wrapped battery with uh, D cells or they might be sub D a bit like with the T1000 where we had sub C so they're going to be that's one two three four five six seven eight cells probably in series given that you've just got one output. And this is quite handy because we've got the lead and we can also see how it's wired up. So although I'm going to have to destroy this in order to uh, find out how it's constructed, I'll be able to document that and um, hopefully have that as a reference for others. But um, again, it's, you've got a handy little tray there to catch any uh, spillage, should there be any leaks but uh, no seem to have avoided that so next up is the power supply and then the uh, shielding to reveal the hard drive which is very noisy but you'd expect that Um, as I'm going along, I'm putting the screws back in where they came out because there are quite a few different types depending on whether they're, they're driving into plastic or metal. Now this bit comes off, or this whole top bit comes off, with one screw removed from here and then you slide it to the right and then that lifts off quite neatly. And if you've unplugged the hard drive power from the power supply, then that should come off with some ease. There's a big old magnet there. And then you've got the floppy drive, which I'm guessing is standard because it has separate power, unlike the Toshiba, which has it all integrated into a proprietary connector with the data. Ah, here's the hard drive. Now, I know this is an 80 meg model, which is the biggest one you could get with this laptop. Um, and it's a Maxter 70, that'd be 70 boat, <laughs> 70B080, I think. Um, and that is obviously a full size three and a half inch drive. Now, it wasn't recognized when I used a little utility called G Setup. 
which apparently you can use if you can't find the reference disk to set up the CMOS parameters. Um, it could not find a hard drive at all. So I'm going to take this hard drive out and I'm going to see if I can uh, get it recognized. If not, mm, tricky part is with laptops like this, they have specific tables in the BIOS to recognize specific hard drives. If you can't replace like for like, then usually you're out of luck. So unless I, unless one of my other Connor ones work, um, we might have a problem getting this working, getting this hard drive working. But it can operate without a hard drive, it'd just be a pain in the butt. So, um, right, let's remove that. Um, most of the capacitors, which are usually the biggest problem with this age of machine, are going to be in the power supply, which is in there. So I will open that up and inspect that internally. I don't want anything to go pop. <clears throat> um, there are some small capacitors on the board. They appear to be in good order. There is some hacky wiring going on, as you often see with uh, first revisions of certain machines, like the original IBM PC had a fair bit of this. And most interestingly of all, the hard drive and the floppy drive run off the same interface. So maybe it is proprietary. Hmm, not sure. Maybe not, maybe they found a clever way of uh, combining the two. Um, there's a decent-ish fan on this as well, but I think it's quite noisy. So I might put a bit of uh, lubricant in there to see if that quietens it down a little. But um, yeah, I mean, just like Toshiba, Epson have manufactured, well, they may not have actually, you know, manufactured them, but they've certainly designed to their own spec the logic chips for this machine. That's going to be the video memory, I imagine. 64K... 10 milliseconds so I don't know what's that uh, 128 256 that's like half a meg of RAM which is what you'd expect for a VJ chipset of this era what's the video chipset I can't is it that one SPC 8000 F or yeah that looks like the right size for a VGA chip. So I'll look that up because that's too small. Um, it's in amazing condition, which is always good to see. Um, look, there's even a hooky little resistor there. But yeah, very modular. I'm very impressed with how easy this machine has been to dismantle. It just means I'm more likely to be able to put it back together again. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hook this up to another computer and see if it behaves. So apart from the battery pack needing to be rebuilt, um, did I? No, I didn't. So this is it. Um, it's quite obviously helpful to have the original battery pack because then we can see how it was all connected up and we can kind of document that um, so I just need to rebuild this basically um, on positive on negative um, and the hard drive is the other question knocking noise. so we've got a good noise there we had a quite a bad knocking noise when it turned on Generally speaking with hard drives, when you've got stuff banging against other stuff, it's not good. Um, but, on the positive front, oh this is my trusty K6 based IBM Aptiva, which is always good for um, this kind of job, because when you're connecting an old hard drive, you don't want to use a computer that's too new, so anything with PCI Express um, or Pentium 4 onwards, generally speaking, IDE kind of plays second fiddle to everything else. What you want is a system where IDE is the only bus. Um, 
and it also should be new enough that it can auto detect the drives that you put in it because if you use an older computer such as a 386 or even a 486 uh, from the early 90s then you're you're going to have to start putting in parameters and stuff and what we want to do is if it auto detects then we know that it's at least half working so 85 megabyte hard drive um, so that's the first step if it's recognized in the well, if it spins up that's step one step two is is it shown in the BIOS step three is boot from uh, an MS-DOS startup disk so here I've got um, 6.22 disk one because what MS-DOS install program, although we're not actually installing DOS, what it will do is do a quick scan of the um, hardware to see if there is a hard drive present. If there is, you get this message, which says welcome, blah blah blah, if you wish to set up MS-DOS now press enter. Um, it doesn't do that if it can't detect a hard drive because uh, obviously you would then have to install to a floppy disk so we quit at that point and if you run fdisk then fdisk won't run if you don't have a hard drive attached press 4 and that shows us that we have a partition of uh, fact 1681 megabytes DOS 4 so that's good. So we quit FDisk. If it's in FDisk and there's a partition, you should be able to go to the C drive. If there isn't a partition, you can make one. So on this hard drive from the laptop, we have got DOS 4. We've also got Windows. I don't know what version. So it was looking encouraging up to a point, but as soon as I try and access any of these files, um, it doesn't work. So let's go to the DOS directory. Uh, there we go. Now, if I try and print the config sys file, we get general failure reading drive C. And that happens whenever I try and run or read any data from the hard drive. What I was hoping was I could recover the data off this and keep that and switch out. But if we turn off hard drive, that's not good. So the question now is, what do we replace it with? Initially, nothing. I'm just going to put it back together and see if we can get it working without the hard drive. Let's go.